Hello everybody, my name is Dallas Stewart. Today I'm going to be showing you how I refinished my Paul Reed Smith Silver Sky. So this is my first time ever considering even trying to finish or do anything uh, on a guitar like this. So of course I got some help from my father and also we practiced on an old Squire of mine. So we were able to work out all the kinks before we got to the expensive guitar. So let's go over the parts list. I got a mint green pickguard from Mojo Axe off of Reverb. I got genuine Fender pickup covers, you know, because I thought that would work, but um, more on that later. I got Godo vintage locking tuners. I got Mohawk instrument lacquer, and there's one quart pictured there, but uh, at the end of this project, we bought four, so more on that later as well. I've got Stumac color tone vintage amber lacquer for the neck. I have pearl seafoam green tint that I got from kppigments.com for the base coat and then 0 .008 inch seafoam green metal flake. So let's get on to the disassembly of the guitar. There really weren't any hiccups here. Uh, I didn't know where the soldering gun was so I decided to use a torch on a screwdriver and um, that did work to melt the solder to get the wires off so that's cool. When it came to removing the polyurethane finish off of the guitar, there were a lot of different options that I watched videos about and read about. The one I wanted to go with at first was removing it with like paint stripper, so I bought Aircraft Paint Remover. I tried it on the Squire first and it did not do a single thing to the poly finish on top. So I went with the second option that definitely turned out to be the better one anyway, which was using a heat gun and scraping it all off with a paint scraper. So now comes the moment of truth. Time to watch me strip off the poly finish on a Paul Reed Smith Silver Sky. It was much easier to scrape the poly off the Silver Sky as opposed to the Squire. And like, I thought that it'd be the other way around. Like, more expensive guitar equals stronger finish. But the Squire literally had like the thickest finish ever. It was so hard to strip off. But this one came off with like ease, so. Um, there's a bit of a science to what I was doing. I would heat it up to the point where I saw it boil and bubble as you can see here and then I would strip it off and it came off no problem. For this guitar the heat gun did not take it all the way down to bare wood. It just took off like the plastic poly top. So as you can see, I had to start sanding for a long time to get it down to the bare wood. I started to get excited when I saw the wood grain, but really it was just this sanding sealer that's actually pretty thick that took a long time to sand through all the way and take it to the real bare wood. And as you can see here, there's a distinct line where it's much darker where the sanding sealer is that they use, as opposed to the bare wood. There were many, many late nights spent getting it down to the bare wood, but here it is. So now it's time to start painting. I started with a rattle can of white lacquer that I bought at Lowe's. Painting it, especially with the rattle can, was really not hard at all. I think almost anybody could get good at this. You just have to make sure that you have a good amount of overlap every time you make a pass. It's also important when you're painting to do it in sections. And what I mean by that is like doing just the front face, then the back face, and then you do the top edge, then you do the whole side, and then you do the bottom edge. And that's not in any particular order. That's just to make sure you don't miss any spots or have uneven coats. 
Now it was time to start mixing in the pearl powder with the lacquer. I was kind of skeptical about how this powder would work with the lacquer, but as you can see it mixed right in and it was a really affordable way to get dyed lacquer. KP Pigments sells that bag as a sample for $2. I'll be sure to link their site in the description too. So now it was time to start spraying the lacquer with our gun. It's a Harbor Freight HVLP spray gun that I'll link in the description as well. And it was actually a really great gun to use for this project. With this and the last coat, we were trying to make sure we had as thin of a coat as we could because my goal was to get a really thin finish that would wear easily and get the relic look but with true playing over time. Now upon further inspection, once we finish this coat, you may notice as well it's not the best looking and it only got worse from here. All I noticed at the time was just that it was really splotchy and we came to realize it was because we could see the grain even through all those coats. So while I was trying to get as thin of a finish as I could with as few coats as possible, that ended up making the finish look transparent. So we tried to fix the problem by adding a bunch of layers of pearl, but there were a couple issues with that. One, we ran out of the pearl powder, and two, we really needed to build up the white base coat underneath that anyway. But we were all mad at it not turning out right, so we kept trying to fix it, so we thought maybe we could just cover it with the sparkle anyway. So we sprayed that, and of course, that didn't turn out good either. It was pretty crazy, but you could still see the wood grain through the sparkle even. So we gave up trying to make it work, and took a bunch of lacquer thinner to it, and stripped it all back to bare wood. And then I ordered more pearl powder and lacquer. Then we started the process all over again. This time we made sure that we built up the white base coat to the point where we couldn't see the wood grain through it anymore. And we did the same with the pearl base coat as well. And as you can see it was turning out much better this time. Now it was time for the scariest part for sure, which was spraying on the metal flake. This process was very finicky because if you didn't get the mix right with the amount of flake that was in the lacquer, it would be really splotchy and it would look really like black in certain spots. But if you mixed it with too little flake, then there'd be like a flake every centimeter, which looked really bad too. And that was actually the case with this time doing it. We were really trying not to get the splotchy look and we kind of went a little too light on it. So of course we went like way too heavy when we tried it the other way. But we just kept going with it with the really heavy and it actually ended up looking really consistent. And I'd just like to also mention like I read in the forums a lot that you shouldn't spray metal flake in lacquer because it's going to take way too many coats or something like that. But I found these videos from literally a Fender Custom Shop painter and he paints with lacquer with metal flake. I'm going to link his channel like right here. It's insane. I can't believe that there's such a gold mine like this on YouTube. I was on the fence about trying to do the metal flake and lacquer but he was definitely the thing that pushed me over the fence on it. So now it's time to move on to the clear coat. And as you can see the flakes are super high above the finish in this shot. So it took quite a few layers to get it to cover up the flakes. So you'll notice in some of these shots that it almost looks like there's black dots where the flakes are. I think the reason for that is that the clear coat hasn't covered up the flake, so there's a shadow that the flake is casting. So we noticed while we were spraying on the clear that it started to look better the more and more we added clear to it. This shot is after a few thick coats of clear and the flakes are still above the finish. At this point we ran out of lacquer again so I had to buy another quart to finish the clear. And you can see in this shot just how thick some of the coats we did were. We got to a point where almost all the flakes were covered except for a few so we just knocked them off with sandpaper. So now it was time for the sanding and buffing process. We started with 400 grit wet and dry sandpaper, then we used 1000, then 1200, then 3000 on this like foam pad, and then we used a buffing compound with an automotive buffing wheel. And we made sure to tape off the controls cavity and the output jack cavity because the buffing compound got everywhere and it would have been really hard to get out of those places. At that point the body was done, so now it's time to move on to the neck. So the first thing I needed to figure out when I was tinting the neck was how I was going to tape off the fretboard. There's two ways you can do it. You can tape it off on the side where the side inlays are, or you can tape it off right on the edge of the frets. But luckily because I was able to practice on the Squire, I got to try both ways. I thought it would be preferable to tape it off on the side where the inlays were so that I didn't tint the white inlays, but the problem with that is whenever you spray on the lacquer, it adds height to the finish. So whenever you peel off the tape, it leaves a line where you can see a step down. So I taped the Silver Sky neck off at the frets, and I actually didn't tape off the neck joint on the neck because my Silver Sky has very loose neck joint fitment. So I decided to build up the finish so that it would 
be a better fitment. I did however tape off the bottom of the joint because I didn't want to add any height to the bottom of it or else that would mess up the setup of the guitar. And for the neck I actually didn't have to worry about sanding the finish off to bare wood because I chose to just scuff it up with some scotch Bright. And that's actually all it took to get the vintage amber lacquer to stick. And I'm glad that was the case because I was kind of worried about how I was going to get the logo to not sand off. And just using scotch Bright was such a gentle abrasion that it didn't cause any issues. And it was the same process as the body as far as painting went, just having plenty of overlap for every pass. And I heard from others whenever I was looking into buying the vintage amber lacquer that it was very touchy. So you have to be really careful whenever you're adding layers because it can get dark very quickly. If you see it in this shot, the neck looks pretty good in my opinion, but look at how dark it is compared to like the white headstock right there. So after I finished tinting the neck, I had to solve the next issue, which was making sure the inlays were not tinted yellow like the rest of the neck. So I tried a few things for this. First I tried using a Q-tip with lacquer thinner, and that was just way too hairy. Then I used these blue shop towels we had, and they were also way too hairy. And I actually found out the easiest one to use was just a rolled up paper towel. Just kind of like fold it over really really sharp like that. Almost using it like a pencil with the lacquer thinner and that worked like no problem at all. Just kind of like painting it almost into the inlays to make sure that it was nice and white again. And I didn't even notice this until we actually finished the guitar but it did leave a height difference in the amount of finish that you could feel but you couldn't see it so I'm not really bothered with it and I did the same thing on the nut as well so this is where the fun begins we decided we were gonna clear over the neck with the clear lacquer as well just to give it more depth and have like a glossy look over it and you know that's a great idea but uh, I forgot to clean the gun out with the flake all the way so I started spraying it and there were a bunch of flakes that got into the finish as you can see it's pretty bad and I was very upset about it. There were a couple solutions we could try with this and I tried the first one which was to pick out every flake with a razor blade and then use more vintage amber over it to try and fill it back in. Unfortunately the vintage amber did not actually cover the holes it just kind of like masked over them and you can still see the gouges that I made. So then I tried plan B which I should have done in the first place which was just to use lacquer thinner on a rag and wipe it off really carefully. It only really got on the front of the headstock, so I was able just to carefully wipe it off there and then respray it over with the vintage amber again. And as you can see, we didn't use as much thinner where the logo was because we didn't want to risk having it peel up or anything like that. So what we did was just kind of feather around the outsides of it until it looked consistent, and then we just darkened it all up together. So thankfully that problem got solved as good as it could have. So then we moved on to clearing the neck again with a clean gun this time. After that it was time to start sanding and buffing the neck just like we did on the body. So I started with a little bit of 400 and then I moved to 1000. And that's where I left the playable part of the neck because I didn't want to have a full gloss finish there. I just wanted the satin finish there. And then we just went right to buffing for the headstock. And it was the same process as we did for the body. And I'm actually pretty impressed with how the neck turned out with its history that it has now. Now it's time for the final touches on the hardware and then putting it all back together. So for the hardware, I didn't really like the chrome look because it's supposed to be more of a vintage looking guitar. So I decided to scuff up all the chrome with scotch Bright to dull it a little bit and make it kind of match the finish of the truss rod cover. And as you can see, if you just sand it in straight lines on the chrome, it actually starts to look like brushed aluminum. And I did the same process to all the chrome bits, including the bridge, the spring plate, the screws, and the tuners. So finally, it was time for reassembly. I started with replacing the pick guard, and I made sure to caliper the pickup heights so that I could have the exact same specs as before. And like I mentioned previously, I bought these off-white Fender pickup covers to replace the white ones, but the pickup pole spacing was actually different, and also I didn't really think it looked that good anyway. And when pressing in the tuner bushing, I just used vice grips and a block of wood underneath to clamp them into the neck. So finally, after a few months of work and a couple hundred dollars, this is the final product for my Seafoam Green Sparkle Nitrocellulose Finish Paul Reed Smith Silver Sky.
I'm very pleased with how it turned out, especially with it being my first guitar finish. I kind of threw me and my dad into the fire with doing a sparkle finish to begin with. It definitely would have been a walk in the park if we did a solid color. But overall, I think this project is definitely doable for a lot of people. Let me know if you guys have any questions about techniques we use or any products I bought or anything. I'll be happy to answer them for you in the comments or something. Anyway, that's it for this video. I'm proud to say that this guitar was the first Silver Sky to be modified and refinished like this. And as always, thanks for watching.